another, again, you can put whatever headers you want in there. So if you want to put freelance work, then you can also put that in there. Again, set it up in a way that makes sense so that we can capture how long you've been doing it and how, how many hours you've done it so we can calculate how much uh, experience you have in that particular freelance work. Okay. Good question. Great question. Makes me, I'm going to add that to my presentation. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, how are you going to put all that into two pages? It's not two pages. That's your private sector resume. Federal resume, three to five pages. Oh. Three to five pages is a good solid one. I've seen 10, 15, but again, you're thinking about an HR specialist that has to look at hundreds of resumes. So you want to make it as concise as possible. Great question. Anyone else? So I saw some eye rolls when you said that. <laughs> what, three to five pages? Yeah. Right. What's the sentiment on that? Y'all think that's not enough? No, it's a, it's a, it's a lot more. It's like, a lot know, more? Yeah, like I, it's hard to kind of compile them into two pages, so like it's good to be able to show your experience that much. Yeah, three to five pages is sufficient. Yeah. So when you get to Sharon's level as an executive in government, you're limited to five. And she has years of work. Years. So it really, it really becomes you becoming a master at words, being able to use those strong verbs, those strong action verbs that you've developed or you executed or you provided oversight. And just really talking high level what you've done. And then, again, that's the meat and potatoes piece. And then you quantify it by giving the bullets of those very strong things that you've done to make the agency company or whatever the case may be a better company. Um, in the private sector, like sometimes it's okay to not show the year, like of your education, because the like, age discrimination might mm -hmm. come into play. I guess in the federal job, they want to see every year education, what year month that you graduated high school. So that I mean, I kind of like I know in some. I'm saying I'm I'm asking because in some cases they say, well, we don't hire any, anybody in the 60s, so. It's, I guess. Well, first, they can't say that unless it's a position that has. I see. I saw that in one of the, maybe not in federal, but like uh, one of the. Anyway, so. Private sector, they, they got their own rules. But federal government, age discrimination is a no. Okay. Right? Just wanted so, to... what I will say to that question is for us seasoned folks, because I have gray hair, <laughs> I don't have my high school resume. I mean, my high school diploma. My, my, I don't have that on my resume anymore, right? Um, I do still have my college stuff, and I simply have the year that I graduated, which was over 20 years ago, and that's okay. If you feel like you've been discriminated, then you have recourse. You just need to reach out to the appropriate people for that, okay? But yeah, you can put your, you can put your year, absolutely. If it is a positive education requirement, you're going to have to provide a transcript and everything anyway. Okay. Any other questions? Nope. Oh, you didn't even talk about this. So, what we have kind of been, so your, your headings, remember those key headers, the summary, uh, professional experience, training, education, accolades, all those things. You're going to use those headings, you're going to qualify yourself. Special projects, we just talked about that, like freelance work. Anytime you work somewhere and you had a really special project that you want to highlight, that's, that's absolutely going to contribute to your, your um, them looking at you in a way that makes you minimally qualified, highlight. And then you're going to use plain, plain language. So again, uh, pitfalls, you know, if you're only focusing on quality, you're not going to get the job. You have to give a whole picture of who you are on paper. Sentence structure, I've seen someone that wrote a whole paragraph sentence. It is hard to read. So make sure that you're writing sentences that make sense and that are, again, concise. Contention is the word. Um, and text blocks, semicolons, all that good stuff, don't do it. Another good practice is once, if you're applying for jobs on USA Jobs, once you put your resume in Word, PDF it and attach it to USA Jobs. And the reason I say PDF it is because sometimes when things get to the HR specialist, 
all these special characters we use and stuff, and kind of show what really funky in these resumes. Okay, so PDF in that way it doesn't, it's not, it's, it can't be uh, modified. So dues, again, I, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse, but I'm gonna keep talking about it, right? You're gonna be thorough, detailed, concise, and make sure you're talking about everything you've done as a person professionally. Um, past tense action verbs for jobs that you've done in the past, make sure they're very strong action words. Again, um, phrases from the job announcement, we'll talk about that. Don't just copy the whole duties and responsibilities and dump it in your resume. That, that, that doesn't really work. And then, when you're quantifying, remember to use percentages and years to show your value to that company or organization. Any questions about that? Do not. Again, you're not just stating your, your, your duties, you're telling them what you're doing. So you're qualifying and quantifying. Um, like I said before, you don't, HR specialists don't know everything. As much as we know that they know, they really cannot accurately retain all of the information they need to know about all of the thousands of jobs that are out there and how to qualify people for all of those jobs. So that's why it's really important that you guys spell that stuff out in your resume. Civilian jargon, um, military jargon, all those things that don't make sense, try not to use it. So acronyms, you're gonna spell those out at least once before you use it again, okay? Um, the caveat to this jargon piece is let's just say you're in the intelligence agency or you're applying for an intelligence job and you have a lot of intelligence experience. There are a whole lot of acronyms in the intelligence community and what you're going to do is probably use those acronyms because you want to stay in intel. And I would say that is okay, right? In those very niche specific industries, it is absolutely okay for you to use those because those are the same types of positions that you're continuing to apply for. Does that make sense? But for the greater good, you really want to get away from using a lot of jargon, okay? So again, what we didn't talk about is you're going to customize your resume to every, yes ma'am? Yeah, can we go back to the, the jargon? Sure. So my understanding is that some agency hire a contractor to screen the resume and some uh, hiring managers bring a uh, subject matter expert to help screen the resume because they don't believe that the contractor possess enough understanding of the mission of the office to appropriately look for things of government. So how, I mean, on the one hand, you have all these jargons and the take up space <laughs> and read and life pages. On the other hand, if it's a special um, situation, you stand the risk of either over explaining to insiders or under explaining to the screener. So, so that's uh, a fine balance out there that you don't know. You don't know. Right. And that's the unfortunate reality of applying for jobs. You don't know. So what, go ahead. Well, I was just about to say, so once you get a letter saying either you don't have to meet the certification because the qualification are not in your resume, what is the recourse? If you think it's there, but it was reviewed by someone who's not, who don't have that expertise to make the right judgment for it, and it was a contractor. So here's the thing. Contractors, HR specialists, contractors in government, even though they're contractors, they're embedded with the feds. And so it's not like if, if, this, if this room right here is DHS headquarters, contractors are back in the foyer doing their own thing. They're literally in the room working side by side with HR folks. And these are highly vetted, highly skilled HR specialists that are coming in to assist with the workload because of attrition or whatever the case may be. Or workload, right? We have to plus up. And the quickest way to plus up is to hire a contractor versus waiting for Congress to give us an FTE and fund it and hire in a year or two, right? When hiring managers are ready to hire for the positions that they have, there's a consultation period of thing that happens well before that vacancy, before you even see it as an applicant. They are talking to the hiring manager, what are your needs, what do you want? And sometimes they have these tiger teams or SMEs, and we do this often at DHS, that come in and say, okay, the PD is written this way, these are the, th we, we develop the questions, 
Like these are the questions that we want to ask to make sure we have the skill sets. So they're not doing it standalone in a, in a silo. They're working with the hiring manager, they're working with their classification, um, their staffing branch managers. So, you know, while there are HR specialists that come into the fold that may have minimal experience because they're just starting, they're learning, and there are always checks and balances in that HR process. So even when they're building the cert list, certificate list of folks who are minimally qualified, they don't just, you know, hey, I'm LaShawn, I make a list, boom, send it to the hiring manager. There are people that have to check their work, okay? So I don't want you to leave with the impression that HR man and HR specialists don't know and they're just kind of willy-nilly doing things. There are so many checks and balances in that hiring process and so many consultative pieces that happen before the vacancy even hits the, the, the portal that you can be assured that it's fair. So to answer your second question, recourse, if you feel like you have not been properly evaluated, you have every right as an applicant to reach out to the POC on their vacancy announcement and ask about your application. Not how you fared against anyone else, but you absolutely are welcome to reach out to them and ask them, you know, questions such as, like you said, you know, I, you know, hey, this is LaShawn Dobbins, you know, I applied for a vacancy number, blah, 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 control number, give them all the information they need and say that I feel that I was highly qualified and talk about where that experience sits in your resume. Instead of just saying, why wasn't I qualified? I feel like I was, right? You can ask for feedback. And even if you made the cert list and you made an interview and a hiring manager does not pick you, you can email the hiring manager and say, hey, could you, you know, may I set up a time to talk to you very quickly? Don't, don't monopolize their time, like 15, 20 minutes, come prepare with the questions that you have for them to ask them what you can do to better your resume or to better your interview, okay? Because keeping in mind that these individuals, especially HR specialists, again, are looking at all these jobs and day to day, they're very transactional and they have to get stuff done. But I know plenty that will give respond to an email or that will maybe answer a phone call. But what happens is when people are not getting the responses that they feel like they should get or they feel like the person is talking in circles, what happens is we have this thing called merit system principles, right? Merit system principles, we cannot give anyone an unfair advantage to a job. So we're gonna give you a by the book answer to your question. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, so I was just wondering, based on like the, the place you've been so far, is there anything that like, students should do that are doing that's like, 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 yeah, so they're full-time jobs for students. No, as in like, like training positions and like internships or something? Yeah, so you can search USA Jobs by the type of job you want. So there's a whole, and we'll talk about that in a little bit too, where you can go in and say, you know what, I'm a student or a recent graduate, and it'll show you all the jobs that pull up that kind of meet those um, cursory uh, jobs that you're looking for. Well, but I'm more talking about like the advice you've given so far. Is there like anything that should be or something? No, same thing. Yes, ma'am. No, uh, LaShawn. Yes. Um, I, I recommend uh, that indeed perhaps maybe people consider USC Jobs has a resume template. Absolutely. And you may be going into that, but I think that probably is going to be your best buy because when hiring managers look at a job, they're going to be looking at certain elements and all the things that you presented have been spot on. And what forces it forces you to do is that when you explain your background, it has word limitations. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very succinct yep. and very concise, as you said, Lajon, yep. because you can't ramble on for about 620 pages here. Exactly. Uh, and I, I do have an appointment of a hiring. And yeah. indeed, I say, that's stop all the acronyms in the military, yeah. because the hiring the HR specialist does not know those military terms. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I forgot. Well, I didn't forget about the resume builder, but I've been doing this for so many years that I kind of know how to format my resume. But that is such sage advice, right? If you use that builder, it's going to limit you to the amount of characters that you can put in there. So you have no choice but to say what you need to say in that. 
And if you don't like the way that the, it spits out, then you can take that and copy that and put it in a Word document and format it in a PDF. They both work. In fact, some jobs are gonna say, you can only apply for this job using the Resume Builder on USA Jobs. So thank you for that. All right, any questions? Did I answer your question? Yes, very much so. The, um, the, the check and balances. Yeah, yeah. We, we, don't, we don't operate in silos in government, especially in HR because there's so many laws and regulations um, around Title V uh, accepted service on how we can hire per people. And then, not only that, once we hire someone, that whole process is audited by an external entity to make sure we did everything we were supposed to do. We hired the right person, we followed all the laws and regulations. The audit happens all the time? Every single one. Really? Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, so jobs for students is a matter of searching for them on usajobs.gov. How, like, how, how, what's the quality of like for jobs that I might be able to see myself working as with not just the Department of Security, but other federal jobs? Is that something that? It shows up on USA Jobs. So when you put it in that path for students, recent graduates, all those jobs across government that are open to recent graduate students, specifically, that are eligible for recent graduate students, uh, appointments, it's there. Okay. However, don't limit yourself just to recent graduate jobs. Apply for other entry level positions that are out there. That's kind of where I was getting at. You know, as a, I just want to know, like, what are the the preferences, the hiring preferences that are they? Oh, I can't speak for all the government on that. Like, I know that from personal experience over the past few years, succession planning is a real thing in government. We're, we're at a point where there are so many, I think I, last I saw the statistic was like a third of folks in government can retire. Mm -hmm. And these individuals have been in government 20, 30 plus years. And that's a lot of institutional knowledge. So agencies are really looking at how to, how to build up the next generation, right? So I know at Homeland, we've done an incredible job of um, funding and standing up new entry level early talent programs so that we can bring in right now the next generation of HR specialists or the next generation of IT folks or the next generation of intelligence folks. So really what you're looking for, again, is how about, it's about how you set your searches and preferences up in USA Jobs that returns what you need, you feel like you want to apply for. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I want to add that indeed I think Pathways is probably a very strong recommendation for college graduates. Because if you have a degree uh, and within two years, I believe, yep. right, Lashawn, yep. you have the eligibility to come under, under Pathways, which is a really nice entry into federal government. Yep. So do look up Pathways when you go to USA Jobs Absolutely. if you've got a recent degree. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So, resume writing tips, time check. Another question here? Yes, uh, yes, 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 sir. Um, so I have a question. Regardless of what program I'm applying to, if there is a conflict between my uh, institution's schedule and the schedule to which I'm supposed to start the program, should I still apply and contact the department and inform them about that potential conflict? So without really getting to, into the specifics, I would say apply. And if you make the cert and you are in, you're, you you have been selected, then have that conversation upfront about what you can and cannot do. Okay. So we've had our student program, and we have folks that couldn't start until you know a week or two later. But really, it's, it's a, it depends on the agency and the program and the curriculum and how it's structured if they can allow late folks to join. Okay. Any other questions? You guys are great. Yes, ma'am. So I had a chance of working with some Skillbridge interns. These are military folks getting ready to retire. Yep. Uh, some of them say, well, they are not allowed to go out. They won't finish their contract until the end of September. How soon or how early should they start doing their job, job search so that they won't have a gap? So for military who are transitioning out, 120 days from when they go on terminal leave, unless they are with DOD. Because DOD has some clauses and stuff, so they got to check with the DOD folks. So not from when you ETS or retire, from when you actually sign out and you're on terminal leave. 120 days, back it up. So, so if they retire at the end of September, they should really start should. their job search 120 days prior? Correct. 
Um, the caveat to that is for those who, of course I'm gonna talk about Homeland, our process takes a little bit longer if you're going into law enforcement, intelligence, things like that. So we encourage folks to apply year out because we know it's gonna take us a really long time to get you vetted, medically cleared, polygraphed, and all that other stuff. Okay? All right, so you're gonna customize each job. Again, that judgment statement, I'm great, I'm perfect. Don't use those unless you can quantify it. Um, again, talk about who you are and what you've done, but be concise and then you're gonna use those headers to guide the resume. So, master resume, this is something that a lot of people don't take into consideration. So, again, I'm a veteran, Sharon told you that. I have an I Love Me book. Anyone know what an I Love Me book is? It's not vain, I promise you, it's not a vain book. No? So, when I was in the military, every award I got, every accommodation, everything that, every personnel action is in a book. When I came to federal government, I slacked a little bit, but every SF-50, every version of my resume, every everything for me professionally is in a book. Why do I keep this book? One, so my first job out of, in high school was Burger King, right? Worked at Burger King for like three years. Um, probably won't ever go back, but what happens if I retire? And I'm like, you know what, I want to own a Burger King franchise. It's not even on my resume. However, I can go back and see what I did at Burger King and maybe pitch myself to the Burger King folks to get a to get a to get a franchise or something, right? The purpose of an I Love Me book, one, is to really just keep up with what you've done and who you are professionally over your life. I couldn't tell you what I did six years ago. And I've been at it and the whole time I've been at home then. Six, seven years ago, I couldn't tell you what I did. But I have a book where I can go back and be like, oh shoot. I got this accommodation, I got this certificate. Like it's not packed away in a, well it is packed away in a box, but I have an electronic copy of what I've done with the department. Master resume is no different. You're gonna have many, 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 many versions of your resume. Your master resume should be this massive document that talks about your experience from when you first started working all the way up to now. This helps you because Let's just say you want to change careers, like I just talked about Burger King, right? But that was 15 years ago. Are you going to really be able to do a resume, functional resume, that talks about the experiences that you had from 15 years ago off the top of your head? Yeah, yeah, no? No, you're not, because you're not going to really remember. You might remember the big highlights, but you're not going to remember the little, the little tasks. Build your resume. A master resume. It could be 30 pages long, 50 pages long, 100 pages long, however it needs to be because as you're beginning to apply for a job and you're tailoring your resume, you can go back and look at your experience and see if there are things that you can pull from past experience to update your new tailored resume for the new job that you're applying for. Does that make sense? Absolutely everything needs to be on this master resume. Everything. And it takes a lot of work to pull this together. But my advice to you today is really to build you a master resume. Get you an I Love Me book and everything that you've done, even if you're in college, everything that you've done, every organization that you've been a part of, anything that you have that can show who you are as a person and how it has built you up to be who you are today professionally should be in this I Love Me book. And you may have volumes by the time you get to be seasoned like me. I do, I have volumes, right? But. That's the best way to do it. You can do it on paper, or you can do it electronically. So how do you go back and gin up all that experience that you had as you're building up your master resume? Master resume? You're going to look to the different sources, sources right? You're going to find your old job descriptions, or I'm going to stick with the Burger King example. If I was a shift leader, maybe I'll go to Burger King website and look at careers and see what the shift leader does and then, hey, I can copy and paste that and put that in my resume for my Burger King experience, right? Use all the resources. Google is your friend. Use all the resources that you have. Um, any courses that you've taken, you can kind of, like I, I've done professional recruiter training, social media recruiter, I have all these certificates. I can go to the AIRS website and look and see what those individual certificates uh, what types of skill sets they give you by, by way of completing that certificate and add that to my master resume in the, in the certificate section, right? Um, again, 
any organizations that you're in, nonprofit, for profit, any leadership roles you've had, you can put those in there, volunteer experiences. Like I just said, your professional academic challenges, successes, assignments, travel experiences, associations, affiliations, all of that stuff is on the table for you to build up this master resume. Okay? Any questions about that? Yes? Would this slide deck be available for us? I'd have to ask Ken. Slide deck, would, would a slide deck be available for them? Why don't we talk after? Okay. All right. So we're gonna talk about how to document education. So those that don't, they have high school diploma, GED, and they have a little bit of uh, educational experience beyond, beyond high school. These are different ways you listen. You listen to courses, or maybe the, the subject area, the mission area, the occupational area, and the things that you've taken to, that falls up under that, when you completed it, where you completed it at. That's one way. Folks that have some college or they're still continuing to pursue their degree, you're listening to school, location, um, the degree type, current GPA if you want to. And there was a question somewhere over here that talked about listing these significant coursework. This is where you're going to list out those, she left, the fellows. The fellow stuff, was that you? No, I think she left. Okay. The fellow information, all that specific stuff that you need that um, you would need to qualify for a job. You put when you're in it, and then you can put how many hours you completed, or you can say something like anticipated a graduation date in December 2023. Okay? Degree completion. You don't necessarily need to put your GPA. I know we're all proud of our GPA, but unless you are applying in a job that requires a GPA or some type of scholastic. Um, superior achievement type of uh, position, you don't really need to put your GPA up there. And then of course, if you're taking independent credits that kind of keep maybe IT certs or your um, HR certifications or contracting certs, whatever the case may be, that's where you'll kind of put that specialized training and professional development. Samples of ways you can do that. Oh, this is the fun part. Why do you want to work for government? Huh? It's a good stability. <laughs> Let me make sure I cover all my good points. Um, so yeah, government is interesting, right? And I know that we we kind of get a bad rap of being in the news by you know sometimes not having a budget being furloughed and all that. But there really is stability in government. Once you get past your um, probationary period, you literally can go anywhere in government. Every job that is in private sector, I promise you, we have it in government. Veterinarians, sir. Oh, uh, I was gonna also ask about um, are are they, are they still doing the student debt forgiveness program? Ah, no idea. To... What I do know is they have public service loan forgiveness. That won't ever go away. Well, well, I, I can't say that. But public loan uh, public service loan forgiveness. If you work in as a public servant. Um, you make on-time payments for 10 years, someone from your agency certifies that you did, your student loans are forgiven. Yes, ma'am. Uh, some agencies, if they choose to exercise it, they can also uh, give you, help you pay up to a certain amount of your yep. loan per year, but they decide which job category, which office, and if you have, like, is this called special attention? Yep. Uh, so Agreed. Yes. Yeah. Right. yeah. So yes, we absolutely have special retention things. Um, and again, it's by agency based on the needs of the agency. So if this is a critical occupation that they need and they're having a hard time keeping that staffed up, they'll offer all types of things to keep people in those positions. But again, it's by agency. You know, one of the things I tell folks that they're applying for jobs, you can it's gonna tell you in a vacancy announcement what's available, but it doesn't hurt to ask. Okay. Um so of course, you're making a difference by doing what it is that you do every day to, to, to save the nation, protect the nation, whatever the case may be. Um, there's tons of opportunities to move up. You get your year, 52 weeks time, 52 weeks of uh, experience in that particular grade level. You can look for the next one. Tons of opportunity for training and professional development. Each agency has what they call um, learning management team. 
um, learning officer division where they have different types of classes of professional development can take. And then of course, um, the benefits, right? You get all the benefits, health, vision, dental, all that good stuff. Um, public, public transit sales need too. So if you're like somewhere that has public transportation, you're allowed, you're afforded that opportunity as well. Any questions? Someone want to talk about pay. I know Sharon said it. So we're talking about the, the GS level. So the, the pay structure, what you see is, when you see GS, that's grade general service, excuse me, general service. And that traditionally, and this is where I'm going to get technical, is Title V service, which means it's competitive service. There are, you can be hired from GS1 all the way up to GS15 before you start applying for jobs in the senior executive service, services. So there are 10 steps in each grade. So at GS1, you have GS1 step 1 all the way to GS1 step 10. And it repeats for every GS1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 15. So um, your pay varies by the area you're in, so how expensive it is. Um, and it doesn't change. So we've been fortunate enough to get kind of like COLA, cost of living increases the last couple of years have been very generous. Um, but of course it comes at a cost to the agency, right? So as we're talking about um, benefits, additional benefits for retention, as we're getting these cost of living expenses, you know, they have to weigh if they have funding to be able to give all these other extra benefits. So it is very easy to start off as a GS7, and go to a GS-9 the next year, to go to a GS-11, a GS-12, 13, 14, so on. So looking at the salary table, which you'll see if there's a variation of pay determined based on your geography, right? So San Fran, California is just expensive. Yes, ma'am? My apologies. Would you mind going back to one slide, please? Sure. So at the bottom, you put the, the 50 magical 52 weeks again. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Um, so I was recently on a detail, right? And the detail position is a 13 slash 14 position. So I could pick either one of those as the number of weeks in either position, or would somebody have to certify that I was operating for punch level at that case level? It depends on what the detail position says. So if they brought you in. Um, as a, but they didn't have a grade, they just had a title. They didn't specify Correct, the but there's paperwork on the back end that would let us know if you're coming in as a 13 or a 14. And so you would need to find out from their detail if it's a 13 or a 14 in order to be able to accurately assess if you would give a credit as 14. Uh, okay, so if it wasn't done at the front end, it can still be done at the back end. You'd have to talk to the agency about okay. that. Yeah. Anyone else? All right. All right. So, like I said, an employee can move from one grade to the next by being promoted. Uh, like I said, from seven to nine, nine to eleven. Um, what happens is you have to be in a position. Two ways you get promoted. You're either in a position that's a career ladder. So when you apply for a job, it'll probably say seven, nine, eleven, or nine, eleven, twelve. Right. Just because you're in that position, I want to be very clear, because a lot of even I make some state coming in thought that it would be automatic at a year. And it's not always automatic. It's based on your performance and if your leadership feels like you're operating at that higher level, right? It's not a given. You have to work for it, okay? Um, or if you're in a position that just says GS7, after your 52 weeks, go start, or well, before your 52 weeks, you can find another job on USA Jobs as a nine, and then you've met that 52 week requirement by the time the job closes, okay? Um, seven and nine are traditionally the entry level. GS five and below, particularly four and below, are usually four, five, three, four, five, are usually what we call student trainings. So when you bring you in a student, like um, not recent graduates, because recent graduates, again, you have a college degree, so you're coming in as a seven. Um, or nine or eleven, but that three, four, five is traditionally reserved for those. So it's a very complex system. 
Um, the steps in between, you get them incrementally. So let's just say you're in that 7, 9, 11 career ladder, right? You come in as a GS7, year one, year step one. Year two, you go to step two. Year three, you go to step three. Year four, you go to step four. Year six, you go to step five. And then they're incremental up to step 10. It takes you, I think it takes like 12 to 15 years to get from step one to step 10, if I'm not mistaken. Because you have so many years, you have to wait the further into that step ladder that you get. So even though those are oftentimes automatic, leadership does have weigh in on whether to delay or approve that. And it's all based on performance. Yes. Uh, could you describe your personal experience with moving up the ladder and moving up in your department? Yeah, absolutely. In, in its current capacity, its current role, the current role, or just period? Or just um, just your past experience. Could you repeat the question? I will. I think depending on where you are, the other side can't be. Sure. So his question was, can I describe my personal experience and moving up? So. The reason I started teaching resume writing is because I used to be that person that had a one-page resume and I submitted it for everything. Literally everything. Overseas job, when working overseas was a thing, and I literally did 75 to 100 applications a week and never got selected. To me, I was the best thing on since life spread, and my resume spoke that, but I had one page. So I was determined to find out why nobody picked me, because I'm awesome. See that judgment word? So, I got into teaching resumes from personal experience. And so I worked contracting for a while. Like Sharon said, I, was, um, I worked um, with transitioning service members, what they called ACAP then, now it's called Soldier for Life, helping folks transition out of the military, giving them the knowledge not to make the mistakes that I made as I transitioned out. I worked there for three years. They promoted me and moved me. I was in Tennessee, Clarksville, Tennessee, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. I got promoted, they moved me to DC to take over the transition center at Walter Reed. Walter Reed got shut down. My company then took me, as still a contractor, and put me in a Hoffman building in Alexandria and I oversaw the, a region in the Army Wounded Warrior Program. Out of the blue one day, I had only been with AW2 for six months. Out of the blue, I get a call from <laughs> Akeem uh, Basharul Dean, who was my previous supervisor at OPM, and said, hey, we just got your resume. Are you interested in working for OPM? I'm like, no, I'm good, because I love what I did. But then the president of the company was like, I heard you turn down a federal job, a job. Call him back and go for the interview. He was adamant that I went for this interview. So I went for the interview um, and got it. How did I get it? Because I networked. That's the key to all of this, too, is networking, right? My resume was out there, and I'm eligible for a non-competitive hire. So I got this job, and I was in a 12, 13, 14. And so that pain about not progressing automatically is a real thing. I was in a, I got, no, I got hired, yeah, I got hired as an uh, entry-level 12, and it was a career ladder up to 14. Um, at the year mark, I didn't get my 13 but it wasn't because I wasn't performing, it was because of budget reasons. And then year two, I didn't get my 13, and at this point in my mind, I should be a 14, right? Because it's a career ladder, budget issues. So guess what? I found another job and got my 13 in FAA, which is, which is accepted service, which pay bans. So what I would have been making as a 14 in regular Title V, I was making at FAA, and I was happy. So I did veterans employment at FAA for a long time, set some records over there, did some things, hired some uh, air traffic controllers in the last public announcement, did amazing things there. But then I was like, you know what? I'm tired. I'm bored. Not tired, I'm bored. I want something else that pushes me because I can do this in sleep. So I applied for the, and actually with FAA, I didn't even apply. The manager called me because my manager, Hakeem, knew that I was burnt out from doing all the work. He was like, I'm gonna send you up for greatness. So I got the job at FAA. My first job that I applied for in years was for Sharon Wong as a national recruitment advisor. She had just come on like six months before me from OPM, but I didn't even know her. That's the crazy thing. I've never met her in my life. I've heard her, I've never met her. So I got that job and we hit the ground running because we got a new executive, we got a new administration, and it was just crazy. It's been crazy every day since then too, but it was really crazy. And they have been good to me. We have moved mountains, we have established programs, 
we do really good work in our our entire division. Like everything that Sharon and her team does is secretary or congressional. So I came in this position and it wasn't a career ladder. But because of the work that I've done, I've been afforded awards, I've been afforded bonuses, I've been afforded uh, what they call quality step increase where I was a, like maybe, I'll say a step one, but because I did so great the year, that, that performance year, they automatically pushed me over to the next one. So, the next step. So there is no career, no promotion potential for me in this position, but I love what I do, and I'm compensated well, and I don't, <laughs> and I'm good. Yes, ma'am. So if my, but let me ask, so did that answer your question? Yeah. It's really about your network. Doing your job, I tell people all the time, don't chase jobs. No, excuse me, don't chase money. Don't chase money. Because if you chase money, you're gonna end up somewhere miserable. Chase the job, find your passion, because then it becomes a way of life for you and you excel at it, and then people know you, and people come looking for you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Would you mind speaking a little bit more about the QSI? Because that's privately between the manager and the employee. So other employees, unless there is such transparency, they don't know that they could, you know, excel and be considered for a quality step increase. So, and that's the thing though, right? Um, quality step increase is basically what it's called. And it's not something that you bring to the table, I feel like. It's based on your performance. So you have this performance plan and you do that plan, but you have to do like a whole lot to get there because it's just, just not your supervisor. Your supervisor is not gonna come in the air and say, oh, I'm gonna give you a QSI. They have to clear it all the way up to the HR director of the agency because there are other people, they have to weigh all of this from a, the, the HR director has to weigh all this aggreg aggregatedly, right? I can't give 15 people in my organization QSI. Someone has to take someone has to take money or someone has to take time off based on performance. So, like I said, if you do your job, your job speaks for itself and your leadership will recognize you in a way that makes sense. Yes, ma'am. So I can give an example that's that thing is reported. It is. So I think I'm good. Can everybody hear what I'm saying? So uh, to Lashad's point about the QSA, and there, there's a variety of mechanisms for which to reward our employees, right? So I might be told there's 15 QSIs for our organization, and we all have to make our case. And I might say, well, Lashad's done well, and it ties back to you know, some of the things she said earlier about writing up your accomplishments. So I don't write it up, and I said, she deserves a QSI this year because she has done all these things, right? And I don't try to nominate everybody because we also know it, it is limited and I have to make her strong, right? And because of our accomplishments, that's how I do it, right? Or I might say, she might not, we don't get any QSI this year, but I want to recognize her in another way. So we get funding to do like uh, um, on the spot awards. And like say, she did really well this year doing such a thing. And I say, I want to, um, you know, I want to nominate her, and, and that is actually my discretion that, that the supervisor that we say. On the spot, she gets X dollars to do this one thing. Over and above and separate from her performance, right? Because you get paid to do your job, right? On the spot, she's done something above that. So there's a number of different ways to reward our employees. Time off is another way, right? A lot of times, especially um, uh, newer employees, Right? They may come in and, or, or um, uh, what's, we see that with parents or those with young kids. It's not about the money. They want the time off to be able to spend time because they've just started and they only got 13 days vacation for that year, 13 days sick leave. And so I'll say, do you prefer the, the money or do you prefer the time off? And some of them will, will actually say, I prefer the time off because I need to do whatever I need is I need to do. Yes. So I just wanted to mention, that it's not always just about the money, and uh, it's, it's there's other ways, uh, particularly the time off is really, especially that people need some time off, especially they got, you know, like I say, family or, or medical or all kinds of things, and then you are giving them an award and you ask them. Uh-oh, stay up, boss. I don't know, I think it's not you. Yes, sir. I'm just well, sure you, uh, you had a job as a contractor? Yes. For 
Is contractor pay tied to GS pay, or is there some similarity, or is it all over no, the sir. map? It, it's, it's not all over the map. It's managed by GSA. GSA sets the labor categories and stuff. Yes, sir. I want to ask how interdisciplinary do you think? Oh, thank you. Okay, I wanted to ask how interdisciplinary do you think your position is? And this is more of a me not knowing um, all the departments type of deal, but um, how often does Homeland Security cooperate with other governmental departments? Every single minute of every single day. We have a 24-7 operations center. That it's not even the federal government, it's state and local as well. Everything that we do is about national security and securing the homeland, and we can't do that by ourselves. We have folks that are in the field, folks on the ground, folks in other agencies, folk, uh, local and state and local um, government. So yeah, like we, we do everything. We got veterinarians, we got pilots, we got swimmers, we have nurses, doctors, me, Sharon's, we got it all. Is, really is Homeland Security technically considered part of the intelligence community as well? No, we do have an intelligence. So the question was, is Homeland Security uh, considered a part of the intelligence community? We are a national security agency. We do have an arm that works closely, is an embedded with the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and they're called the Intelligence and Analysis um, Team. So they are our intelligence yielding arm. Um, but there are several components, other agencies that fall up on the DHS that have intelligence positions there as well that are not necessarily embedded with um, ODNI. Yes, sir. Uh, um, I have a question about the last slide. Um, thanks for touching on uh, this was for experience rather than the pay. Um, I just want to confirm is this like the pay scale for all federal organizations or is it just? Just DHS. So all Title Five agencies. Okay. So essentially, the the executive branch of government. Okay. You so, do have some entities that are what they call accepted service, and their pay scales are completely different. They pay band, and pay banding typically means that if a position is a, uh, they have some letter or something associated with it, but it ends up being like two or three GS levels combined. Okay. So if I was in one um, level, but then I transferred to another federal organization, like Department of State, that uh, I would still be in the same If grade you're level. applying for a job at that level, um, yes. Or you can apply for a promotion if you have a year of experience at that lower level. Okay, that makes sense, thank you. Yeah, you have something? Yeah, I was just wondering if you wanted to just put a brief information to CTMS, the new person. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> we have a new system called Cyber Talent Management System. It is Title VI and it is reserved for those who are in the cybersecurity industry. So it's not tied to um, it's not tied to the pay scale per se. You are paid based on your experience, not in the traditional way that we do Title V or expanded service. It's really complex. I can absolutely direct you to the website to find more information. That's about the best I can give you. All right, so USA Jobs. We've got a little less than 30, well, a little, a little about 30 minutes. Um, these are the different packs. So someone was talking about open to the public, veterans, senior executives, Peace Corps, federal employees, real spouses, student, recent graduates. These are the different paths that you can go and click on in USA Jobs to find the types of jobs you're looking for. Okay. We're going to get into a demo here in two minutes. So let's just really talk about what open to public means. This is real simple. It's just open to it's open to everybody. Anybody can apply. Status candidates, that's only for people who are current federal employees or reinstatement eligible. And that just basically means you left government, you're coming back, you want to come back in, so you have to provide a status of SF50. For those who have and this gets so complex, I used to get a lot of questions about this. Non-competitive eligibility, in some instances, you can't apply for that. So like veterans can apply to that just based on their honorable service, right? Um, and then merit promotion is reserved for federal employees of that agency. 
or other federal employees of other agencies. Again, if you read the vacancy announcement, it will absolutely tell you who can apply, and it has like one of those little information thingies that you can click on, and it'll tell you the definition of what that means, okay? So category rating, just go over there really quickly. Um, oftentimes category rating puts you into three buckets. You're highly qualified, um, well qualified, and qualified and not qualified. So this is what we call the cert list. When the HR specialist is looking at everybody that applied, they applies, they put them into buckets. Folks in the highly qualified bucket are the ones that end up on the cert list that goes to the hiring manager. So um, it, this, this approach gives agencies the flexibility to, uh, to really just assess everyone and select folks and put them in the position that they're in. Uh, based on a numerical scale, right? So if you have more of the, again, your resume, if your resume speaks more to the experience that's desired in this resume, then you're absolutely going to most likely want to be qualified, right? Most likely, because veterans preference, if it's honored in these vacancy announcements, mm -hmm. veterans preference trumps. Everyone. And basically what that means is a minimally qualified veteran. So let's just say on a scale of 1 or 100, 70 is minimally qualified. If everyone in this room, well, I'll just use Sharon and I. Sharon and I both applied to the job. On paper, we look the same. And we both got 70. I'm a veteran. I'm 100% disabled veteran. So I get 10 points added to my score. So now that makes me have 80 points and Sharon has 70 points as a public person. And then I would be number one, she would be number two. The more veterans that apply, that have preference, the more non-veterans kind of slide down that list. Does that make sense? That's the easiest way I can explain it. Yes, ma'am. So, um, I know we touched upon this. Thank you. I know we touched upon this before, but I want to go back to it. Um, you, you said that there are checks and balances for people who put resumes either qualified or not qualified, right? I have heard stories of people who are acting in the capacity already for a year when, because they're a deputy and they're acting while well, the, the search is going on for the deputy, uh, for the director. And somehow they were certified as not qualified. Well, they were certified and qualified the first time and they went through the interview process and for whatever reason, budgetary or whatever, the position was not filled. When it was re-announced, they apply again. Same person, still acting, and they the second time they would be not qualified. So, how would that explain? So I can't speak to what other agencies do, but we don't know if they changed the PD, they weighted some things differently, like things happen. And I honestly am not in a position to sit here and talk about what other agencies do, and I don't know what our agency do, because I'm not HR, I'm not operational HR. Um, again, my thing is, you know, I've seen it happen, we've all seen it happen if you've been in federal government, I honestly don't have a professional answer. My personal belief is what's meant to be yours will be yours, and maybe that's an opportunity that wasn't supposed to be yours, and maybe you dodged the bullet. That's just kind of how I look at life. Glass half full instead of glass half empty. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So what the HR Veteran Determination Office is in the category, and what the candidate has notified, they notified how you, whether you are in the HQ or well? No, the only, the only, the only notification you get is if you were minimally qualified. Yeah. And then the follow-up question would be, so does that mean if the government patient say you got it for, does that mean you will get it for interview? No, it does not. Because a hiring manager can interview one candidate, no candidates, or they may have gone to a job fair and found a candidate that fits what they're looking for and this person is eligible to hire without posting on USA Jobs. or. They can lose funding for the position, and then it's, it's, it's pulled back there. Just because you make the cert list doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be entitled to an interview. Yes. The, the veterans, I, 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 I don't plan to work for the but well, my daughter is, but mm -hmm. just in case I do in the future after I retire, I'm not working for the I, I served. Over 30, I served 30, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. but that still counts. 
As so long as we're honorably discharged, we have 52 14, you're good. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Now, the way you get 10 points is you have to be a comp you have to be receiving VA benefits. Okay. So to their point, give me just a minute. Veterans preference. So even back to Sharon and I, we applied for this job saying thing on paper, we're both 70, now I'm an 80. Even if Sharon was a hundred on paper and I was the 70, but I got my 10 points at 80, I'm still gonna go to the top of Sharon. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, so that is preference. Usually, not even one. There's no preferences that that rise like that. Floor. That float. Yeah. No, no other preferences float except for veterans. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Is everybody gonna run and join the military? Yeah. Let's do it. Wait. Uh, one clarification. So just because you float. Thank you. Just because you float after the interview process, though, the manager still has the discretion, or do they have to pick the veteran? Good question. <laughs> so, you cannot pass over a veteran. You can, but man, do you have to do some serious justification, not to only your agency, but to get OPM to look at it and approve why you're passing over that veteran. Not easy. Okay. Any other questions? Because it really has some good questions. Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm not sure where it goes. I'm not sure where we're close to wrapping up, but I was going to ask, do you have any general life advice for us students and just for the rest of us? Any philosophy or general life advice? Uh-huh. Don't chase the money. Do not chase the money. Find your passion, and your passion is going to fuel you and get you the recognition that you deserve. You're going to become really well known at your job, and the people are going to look for you. Okay? And network. Network. Know who you are. Be able to walk up to a Sharon Wong and say, "My name is Lashawn Dobbins. I serve as a, you know, well, I'm not, not even going to tell them my title. My name is Lashawn Dobbins. I have over 30 years in recruitment and outreach." I've done X, Y, Z, 30 seconds. So just think of it as being in the elevator. You meet, you meet someone that's really well known. Who are you in 30 seconds that you can leave an impression on them? Be a master of network. Because your network is really how you get that job. Yeah. Um, I also mentioned, because I think uh, the question was raised about hiring authorities. There's also a hiring authority for persons with disabilities, and that's called the Schedule A. So you can do... Uh, uh, hiring officials can do direct hire of persons with disability and what that means is that you have a, vet, uh, a medical direct doctor or a rehab uh, that completes a schedule a letter on your behalf and right now OPM is getting a lot tougher they're saying okay some people might um, try to put a doctor's you know letterhead and all that together so uh, the EEO office does review all schedule a letters and verifies with the provider who wrote that letter to assure that it is authentic and legitimate. So that is another resource for folks that uh, might have um, uh, uh, you know, persons with disabilities. So just wanted to add that to uh, the veteran hiring. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm about to do a couple of live demos since we only have a little bit of time left. You might have to fix your projector. Okay, oh, okay. Hey, thank you. My pleasure, sorry about that. All right, so one of the things that I, I talk about is using tech crowd. Um, if we go to a USA, uh, uh oh, sorry, it's not my computer. If we go to a USA, USA jobs, so remember how I say you're going to tailor your resume. So don't, don't be the person that copies and pastes all of this into your resume, okay? <laughs> You're not perfect for the job. And being perfect for the job means that you copied and pasted all of this. What you want to do is a couple of things. If you go to Tag Crowd and copy and paste that in there, what's going to happen is Tag Crowd is going to highlight or make larger the words that are the most important in that duty description, I mean, that job description. So you talk about the bigger the word, the more important it is. So let's talk about performance, development, instructional, training, support system, design. The words that are the least is, um, let's see, cost, applications, 
team, use TagCrowd to help you figure out what words are the most important in a job description. And make sure these words are highlighted, or not highlighted technically, but highlighted or put into your resume. Again, you're gonna read this, it's gonna tell you everything you need to know about the job. Another way, so right here, when we talked about education and there were some jobs that had a positive ed uh, education requirement, this is one right here. So the person who applied, the people that applied for this job must have 24 semester hours in any of these, any of these areas. So again, back to that slide where we listed significant coursework, you're gonna list out the courses that fit this requirement on your resume specifically. Call it out so that the HR specialist can see it and not have to dig through your transcript to figure out which ones meet this requirement. Another way you can tailor your resume is looking at the occupational questionnaires. The occupational questionnaires become very specific about what it is that that agency is looking for. So you're gonna look at the questions and they're gonna ask you like question number two. You have one year analyzing, uh, analyzing, developing, implementing, and evaluating performance improvement systems. Be able to speak to this in your resume if you've done it, right? Because these are the things very specifically that this agency is looking for. Do you have experience in doing this for military or government personnel. Man, another way that you can beef up your resume to speak to the experience that's required in this job. And you do that for each one of those occupational questionnaires that are relevant to your experience. Questions? Here's another one. I'm gonna put this one in, tag crowd. And this one is for uh, emergency man management uh, specialists. Boom. Operations, co-op, exercise, requirements, plan, support, continuity. Words that should be readily available and plentiful in your resume. If we go scroll down, don't be like me and just keep scrolling. I need y'all to read every single word that's in this vacancy announcement. I just know where to go to find stuff. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see, this doesn't have an occupational question there. Oh, it's a joint duty. This is a joint duty job. Just means you're detailed over for this position. But look, it's telling you what you need to do. Once you're selected, these are all the things you need to do while you're on board. They'll also tell you there's no education in the substitution for this position. Again, read it all the way through. Look at this, it's telling you what you need to include in your work history. Job title, duties, the name of the agency, supervisor, email name and phone number, starting end dates, month and year. So that they can determine if you're qualified for this job. So I know that I am just kind of speeding through this. Here's another place, another qualification section. That boom, we can go and paste this in there and see what comes out on the back end of it. Continuity, that's that word again. Management, exercise, emergency, staff, office operations, project, working. Of course, we know you're working. But this is giving you words or phrases or things that you can use to build, tailor your resume for each job that you're applying for. Yes, ma'am. I don't know whether we're going to be going through this, but I also heard not just um, looking through the words uh, that are on there, but also I heard about we have to also put how much you were paid. Yeah, so it, I, 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 I did mention that earlier. Okay. You don't have to unless mm -hmm. the vacancy announcement says do so. Okay. If you don't put it up there and it's a requirement, you screen yourself out. Okay. Mm -hmm. And also your social security. No, 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 no. No. Okay. Nope. No. All right. Um, it's just, when you create your USA Jobs profile, I can't remember, I had them for so long. I don't know if you put your social in there, but they'll collect that from you when you're hired. 
Okay. Yeah. All right. I came in a little bit later, so I must. No worries. No worries whatsoever. You. My pleasure. Yes, sir. This is more of a security question or anything. Um, do you know, are there any tips to discern whether or not a potential website or medical documentation might be a scam or trying to impersonate the government? .gov. .gov, okay. Use .gov. If you get an email address from anybody or an email from an agency, it's a .gov. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Alright, so I'm from uh, I'm from the San Francisco Bay Bay Area. So I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area, and I've also worked with a lot of people from Silicon Valley. So one of the practice common practices is people putting their um, LinkedIn URL on their resume. So I have a question: like, is that something that you would recommend? I've done it. Okay, for for these government jobs. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And so you missed. I, I think because we talked about. The, the header stuff up front, one of the things that I did uh, kind of discourage folks from doing is putting your full address out there. Uh -huh. Just put your city and state, uh -huh. because there are some jobs that are gonna say you must live within the local commuting area. But don't you don't necessarily have to put your, your, your physical address. If you're hired to the agency, you'll provide that to the HR specialist. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, my question is not uh, directly related with uh, like full-time job, but no, for uh, for example, can you explain how work also government contracts? Uh, and because if you do research in Central Asia, which we do, uh, I know that it's many opportunities also for LLCs and non-profits work with government, but it's a lot of restrictions about citizenship. So can you give some information about those type of contracts where um, we can look on that and can people who no, haven't clearance or who in a board of non-profit or owners of LLC uh, no, originally took these contracts if they're not citizens of the United States. So it will be helpful. Sure. So I don't have much to say about, about that. What I will say is that Contracts, there's not one singular place where contract opportunities are listed. Um, I honestly don't know how people find out about jobs for agencies that are contract. You know, just the, the regular job boards, Indeed, um, Monster, things like that. As far as the federal agencies, what we're talking about is like the federal track. And I know that majority of the agencies, you must be a U.S. citizen. But in that job announcement, it will absolutely tell you what the requirements are and what you need to have possessed in order to uh, apply for the job. So outside of saying, just really check the, the, the job boards. Or if you know a, a particular company who has government contracts, you can always go to their web page and look at their careers. Anyone else? All right, so um, what to expect next, right? When you're applying for a job, again, you're gonna get notification that your application is received. It's oftentimes a very uh, generic email from USA staffing saying we've received it. Um, Sometimes, so they'll review, the, yep, they will review all the applications to make sure they screen out or screen in everyone who meets the basic eligibility requirements. Um, and the job requirements. So basic eligibility requirements traditionally are, you know, U.S. citizen or in our instance at DHS, we have something called BFOQ, uh, which is a bona fide occupational qualification. What that essentially means is that ICE, who has one, is an authority from OPM to be able to go post a job on USA Jobs only for, it's gender related, so only for females. ICE does this for their law enforcement positions to ensure that we have more females to serve the female public that we interact with regularly, right? Um, if you pass the initial screening, this is step, oh, oh, yeah, don't miss this part. Those additional assessments, you don't take them at the time of the application. Once your application is submitted, you get an email, oftentimes it'll go to your spam folder, and there's an additional assessment that you have to take, and you only have like 48 hours to do it. So if you don't do that additional assessment in 48 hours or within that time window, then you're disqualified from the job. Um, after
doing an assessment, they're gonna pay, put you in one of those buckets, right? Best qualified, well qualified, or qualified. And then those that are in the highest qualified category is gonna go on to the hiring official. And then again, like I said earlier, the individuals that are on that list, the hiring official may choose candidates for interviews or they may cancel the search for whatever reasons. Once a hiring manager, step six, selects the best candidate for the job, HR then notifies that individual and begins the process of bringing them on board. You should receive notification that you weren't selected from the job, but sometimes those things take a little bit of time to get back to you. Any questions about the process? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned earlier a notification or a site or whatever. CTMS? Yes. Yes. I have, give me, I'll, I'll talk to you afterwards oh. and find out what it is. All right. So about security clearances. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. You might have answered this before, but no um, how long does it, because it seems like there's so many steps, right? Yeah. Um, and especially with the security clearance for some of the different departments. So how long does it, usually the hiring process takes? Is it like two weeks? Is it six months? It's not two weeks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, I don't know what the government wide average is, but like speaking from a home, Department of Homeland Security, two to six months. Um, actually, two to six months on regular, and I say regular job, non, non law enforcement jobs. Our law enforcement jobs usually take about a year because we have medical standards, we have to meet polygraph, security clearance stuff that we have to meet in order to get folks to a point where we can vet them and extend an offer. So, yeah, private sector, you know, you can interview with me today, um, give me your resume today, interview today, and then you're working tomorrow. Government, it takes a little bit of time because of all the rules we have to follow in order to get folks hired. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. So, good segue. Most jobs do require security clearances, even if it's um, just like a public trust. We want to make sure that you don't have anything, you know, outside of like the parking ticket and all that other stuff. Unless you owe millions of dollars in parking tickets, you should be good to go. Um, but the clearance process does take place after you've received your tentative job offer, right? So as soon as you say, yes, I want to accept this job, we send out a link for you to do what we call equip, right? We ask you all these questions for your experience, you know, seven, seven years or 10 or all your life, depending on the level of clearance. And then that it's based on the job that you hold and the level of access that you need. And it varies throughout the agency, it varies throughout government. Um, even if the job doesn't necessarily require a secret or a top secret clearance, every job has a security clearance. Like I said, most of those are public trust, non-critical, non-sensitive, whatever the case may be. I cannot impart upon you enough, be honest in your clearance. Be honest about anything. If you have flaws, you've messed up in life, everyone is entitled to mistakes. What an agency, what, what, what works in your favor is when you're brutally honest about who you are and the mistakes that you've made and you own it versus trying to hide it. And when they find that you hide it, guess what? That job that you dreamt of, you are now removed from that position or you're not even offered the job. Yes, ma'am. Sean, I want to add that very important piece because background uh, investigations occur throughout your career. You've got a PIF card, a personal identification uh, card, but that expires after a certain period of time. So you might have it for two or three years. Then they're gonna come around and say, I need a background check on you. They will go to your neighbors, ask about things. They will look to make sure that in fact, the degree that you said you got, you did get. And any time that you, do, you misrepresent anything, you're out of the government. You're out, be honest. And you know, and I know that, you know, a lot of folks have, Having financial challenges does not um, keep you from getting a, a, a clearance. It's about how you're mitigating that, right? How are you, be, just, just be honest. I just can't even say that, just be honest. It's, you make mistakes, we all make mistakes, they know people make mistakes, they've seen worse than probably what you're presenting with. Just be honest. And the reason we have clearances is to, to, is to make sure that we are able to do our duties without due influence from someone that's holding something negatively over your head. Okay, just be honest. And yeah, you do get re like, I know I've been re-educated, but they don't call me unless they won't call you until there's a problem. They're gonna continue to check your background check. More, the, the higher your clearance, the more scrutiny you get. Watch who your friends are. 
cannabis is still illegal. And in some instances, with our at the federal level, at the federal level um, and if you have had contact with it, there are some instances where you may not get a job because it's, it's still illegal at the federal level. Social media. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Isn't that good? laughs> scrub that social media, but even if you scrub it, it doesn't go away. We, they have ways of getting, they, they will pull your history. And I don't care if you archive it, delete it, it's there. It's not going anywhere. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes. This question is related to the security clearance process. Sure. I have been looking at a certain internship with the CIA. It looks like they say that I have to get a security clearance before yep. the application process. So for some certain agencies, it's the process is security clearance first. Once you send up the information, then uh, applicant uh, interview rate. Uh huh. I believe it. Okay. The CIA. I absolutely believe that. And when they say it's recommended that the clearance is done in a year in advance, that means that before the duty of the actual application itself, you have to go through the security clearance process. Yeah, but I would encourage you to reach back to the POC, but that sounds about right because it takes about a year when you have to do the, the, the higher level clearances. So you're talking about CIA, who, yes. if they're like Secret Service, all their folks have to have top secrets. Okay, so check with the organization. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, so this is pretty much the end of today's presentation. Thank you guys for being such an amazing audience and being receptive and asking all these great questions. Takeaways, network, 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 right? Get your 30 seconds to build together, rehearse it, know how to say it in your feet, in your sleep. Quality over quantity, meaning your resume should be solid. Doesn't have to be long to be solid. Three to five pages, you're able to get in what you need to get in, be concise about who you are and the, the value that you brought to your agency. Tailor your resume for each job that you're uh, applying for. Okay? Don't you don't be like me and use that one one-page resume and apply for everything and, and wonder why folks aren't calling you. Okay? And then Again, reading that job, that vacancy announcement, making sure you read it thoroughly. Don't scam. I cannot even, man, read it. <laughs> because you're going to miss something if you scam, and that something that you miss maybe will get you disqualified from applying to that job or being qualified for that job. So make sure you submit all the documentation that it requests. Okay? So it has been my absolute pleasure being here today speaking to you guys. Um, thank you for having me. If you have questions, I'll stick around for maybe another. 10 minutes, then I gotta head out to Springfield to go oversee a program. <laughs>
uh, I'm an example, engineer to this. Lashawn's an example, we're all examples here. So I encourage you, it might seem long, talk to any of us. As a matter of fact, the panel after lunch, the next panel in this federal track, is to hear from um, some, some of those, what we call it the SES, Senior Executive Service. That's when you get above that GS-15. I think they used to call it 16, 17, GS-16, mm -hmm. 17, 18. But that is our Senior Executive Service, which are the leadership across the federal government. We are the ones that are within the agencies, make sure things happen, right? So that will be at what time is it now? Let me, so at 12.30, we have a panel of SESers that are coming um, uh, and they're uh, um, uh, NHPIs, right? So you will hear their story of how they progress in federal government. Um, also for the rest of the day, you all heard about the resumes that, that LaShawn keeps talking about. We actually had somebody that was a senior uh, uh, policy advisor at DOD. Now, she retired, but now she reviews resumes. So if anybody have your phones, I know y'all can pull up your resumes if you wanna sign up. She's free for her to take a look at your resume. 15 minutes. She's been doing this for years. They charge a lot of money. There's companies out here charge a lot of money to review those resumes. If you've got it, 15 minutes, she can look at your resume and give you some tips. All right, so I wanted to just let you all know that too. But then just hearing the stories, that's helpful. All right, so just again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, LaShawn. I appreciate it. I love you. I have a great team like LaShawn uh, who, who helped us with that. So, thanks everyone. And, and again, LaShawn is here. You can ask her. I did not for myself, I offered you. <laughs> uh, any questions? Thank you. I just want to add that if anyone is interested in the 15 minute resume review, uh, this wonderful lady is retired now, very skilled in private and in federal government. Uh, you need to just go to the registration desk right down the hall here, and then there's a sign up. So if you want your 15 minutes of fame with this resume reviewer, take advantage of it, because it's not often you get that. Yeah, and Sharon organizes, so very, very important, very important. Yeah, so go to registration, you can sign up for a review of your resume in 15 minutes.